Okay, so the hand we're gonna analyze today is a hand that took place in part four on my 10K scoop main event breakdown. So I open ace queen in middle position and Ole defends the big blind. And then we get this flop that's really good for my range uh, where we have a significant range advantage and that tend me to believe that we should be C betting this with a very high frequency, probably 100%. So basically a blind C bet and whenever we're doing that, we want to use a small size in general. Even though we have a really good range advantage and not advantage, I still think we, since we want to bet this 100%, we want to use the small size. So that is what I did. So I bet 7K, and then I'm faced with this really small check raise. 3X my bet for half the pot. And at the time, I was pretty convinced that I shouldn't have many 3 bets in this spot. So I went ahead and called. I remember pointing out that I wasn't sure uh, how to approach versus this tiny check race. So I called and then we get the four of hearts on the turn and our opponent checks to us. So at this point, I'm pretty sure I need to go ahead and bet my hand. And my understanding of these scenarios is that we want to bet a big portion of our range, if not our entire range at this point, just to sort of define villain's range. So that is what I do. I bet 40%. Because of what I don't want to do is check back here and let me realize his equity if he would say he was check raising a small pair, for example. And I also don't want to be capped uh, heading into the river, meaning that if I always have worse than trips when I check back here, it's going to be pretty easy for my opponent to exploit my weak range on the river by using over bets. So Ola calls and the river is the 10 of spades and he checks again. And now I need to decide if my hand is worth value betting or not. At the time, I was pretty sure that it was. Checking back here seemed a little bit nuts, uh, given that I have uh, essentially the fourth or fifth nuts. So it seems sort of mandatory for me to put some more money in the middle, especially give my small C bet and the tiny check race, followed by a lot of passivity from my opponent. So I suppose what I wasn't sure of was my sizing here. You can see stack sizes are a little bit awkward where Ole has 260 behind, so he has less than 2x pot. So I was pretty certain that I either want to bet a big size here, which I would do with all my bluffs. And I don't think this is a spot where I want to value bet very wide for obvious reasons. And whenever that's the case and my range is sort of polarized between my bluffs and my really strong hands that wants to value bet, I want to use a big size and I definitely thought that this would qualify as a value bet given that I have ace queen and I would be more inclined to check back some of my weaker aces but I thought ace queen here can still get value from a lot of worse aces in my opponent's range like the ace deuce the ace threes the ace five and so on so I thought this was for sure going to be a value bet but yeah what I wasn't sure about was the sizing so I went with a full pot size bet here and my opponent folded. So now we're gonna head into Pyro Solver and try to make sense of this spot, see what we can learn. In order for us to get better value out of breaking down these spots, I like to start by asking myself a few key questions of what I'm trying to learn by studying this spot. So instead of asking myself, what do I do when I continuation bet on ace, ace, nine for a small size and my opponent check raises me for half the pot, and then proceeds to check call the turn and I don't improve on the river, that spot is only gonna occur so often. So I like to formulate my questions from a much broader perspective. And a good learning exercise here is to try to come up with some natural bluffs that you can think of. What are some of the combinations that he might use in his check race bluffing range? Obviously the value range is pretty self-explanatory. He would check race a lot of aces. But what are some of his bluffs and what are some of his weakest value bets? Would he check raise a nine here? Does he check raise for protection? Does he check raise thin for value? How does he split his range? We really try to understand and then we can look in Pio and see what the computer will do and then we can compare the two to how accurate our understanding of this spot is. So if I was in all his spot here, I would probably look to check raise bluff. Hands like 10-8 suited, for example, with the backdoor flush draw. I think that would, could make some sense. Fold out all the king x in my range. Fold out hands like king queen, king jack, all those sort of holdings. If we establish that this is a really good board for my range, then we know that I should be C betting at a high frequency. And whenever I'm C betting at a high frequency, I'm gonna have naturally gonna have a lot of weak hands that's gonna struggle to defend versus check races. 
That's why check racing spots like this can be very profitable versus the right opponent. You'll see that naturally the computer will defend a lot wider as compared to most humans. But it's important to remember that the reason for this is that the big blind is also check racing a lot wider than the average human. So there's a balance there. So you always have to adjust. You can't just look at the computer, look what the computer is doing and copy that. No, you have to adjust your ranges and your tendency depending on who you're playing against. If your human player are using complete different tendencies, then the output from the solver isn't going to be accurate and you're actually going to burn a lot of money that way. So that's not the way I like to use solvers. I like to use solvers for reference and to understand patterns. And that's what we'll be looking at in today. Okay, so here we have good old Pio Solver. Uh, if you're not familiar with the software, I'll run over real quick how it works. So basically what you do is you input under positions range right here. You input in positions range, which is in this case, my range. So Basically, these are the hands that I would be opening from these positions. Um, as you can see, fours plus, ace 10 off plus, all the suited nines and all the suited aces. And then here we have out of positions range, so the big blind defense range. So we can see we expect him to three bet these aces and ace king suited, probably kings most of the time, and then everything else is a bit of a mix, some frequencies, three bet bluffs here with smaller suited combinations. I think in theory that he's supposed to, to three bet some of these smaller suited aces as well and probably in practice as well, but I left those out. It's not gonna make a huge difference. So I'll have a pretty narrow range compared to my opponent. And then we got the board here, ace, ace, nine, rainbow, uh, the pot size, the effective stacks. And then here is where we implement our bet sizings. And this is probably the most controversial part of this whole software where people are arguing that if you don't input the right bet sizes here or accurate bet sizes, I should say, depending on how your opponents are playing, it's going to make a huge difference in the output. And you'll see that uh, real soon. So we want to sort of simplify this, not make it too complicated, not adding too many different bet sizes here because the more bet sizes we add, the more complex the whole situation becomes and it's going to be harder for us to gain any real value from it. So what I've done here is I've used the actual bet sizes that we used in game. Obviously, it's really hard to know exactly what bet sizes your opponent might be using. You have to do a bit of a guesstimate there and use your experience and what you've seen in game so far and try to sort of guess what sort of bet sizes they could be using. So I've not included a dunk bet here on this board, I'm pretty sure no one's dunk betting the ace ace nine as the big blind caller. For obvious reasons, the, this board is so good for in positions range, so we shouldn't be dunk leading here. What I have done instead, I've given him two different check race sizes here. So 3x pot and 5x pot. And as we remember, he used the 3x pot in game. I included the 5x. It's not going to make a huge difference. Um, I just wanted to see if the 5x is preferred or if it prefers the 3x. So those are the inputs, the boring stuff. Now let's go to the browser and see what outputs the solver has given us. And it looks like this. So here we see a little bit more clarity. So we have the board here and this is our root, basically our game tree. So first act is of course the big blind. And since I didn't give him any leads, his only option is to check. I know for a fact that Ola doesn't play any leads here in the spot. So I know so far so good. So far we have an accurate output here. And this is again his range. Of course, that could look a little bit different. I'm not sure. Maybe he's three betting more. Maybe he's, maybe he's peeling a little bit wider. But theoretically, this is a pretty accurate range of what hands you should be defending here in this circumstance. So we start with a check. And on the right, we see my two options. So I only gave myself a 20% c-bet here because I'm pretty certain that I don't have many bigger sizings here on this type of board texture. I just want to bet my entire range for a really small size. And as we can see, that's pretty accurate so far. Out of these two options, the computer likes to bet small at a really high frequency. 85% of the time, we firing out the 20% c-bet. And we can easily simplify this by betting our entire range for 20% pot. And here's where things gets interesting. So this is Ola's response, the big blind's response to our 
blind C bet on this board that really favors in positions range. So let's go over the options real quick. So folding 51% of the time. So he's folding a huge portion of his range, even versus this tiny C bet. And the reason for this is, of course, that he's going to have all these hands that have really low equity. We can get an overview of his equity distribution by clicking here on equity, out of position. So hands like Queen Do Suda, for example, 18% equity. Yeah, there's no way, even versus that tiny C bet, there's no way you'll be able to continue these hands, even with a backdoor flush draw. So yeah, all of these are simply forced to fold. So let's look at his calls instead. And he's calling 39%. So still pretty wide calling range, I would say, on this type of board texture. So he's calling all the nines, obviously. Uh, he's not folding any pair so far. And he's even calling some of these backdoor and overcard hands, hands like 10-8 suited uh, that I spoke about earlier that I would personally see myself using in my check racing range. And speaking of check races, the red portion here represents a check race. We can see that the smallest check race, the 3x check race, is mostly the preferred size. The only one that really prefers to bet big, that likes the 5x check race, is pocket nines and ace king. And the reasoning there, well, with nines, for example, I'm going to have so many aces in my range that I'm just going to have to call down anyway. And uh, nines doesn't block any of the aces, so it's going to be really easy for him to get value. By racing to 5x rather than 3x, it's going to be a lot easier for him to get all the money in by the river without the board changing too much. And similar with Ace King, he's dominating all my weaker aces, so he just want to use that big size and really charge all my aces for maximum value. And as for bluffs, you can see he's actually using these small pairs as bluffs, and I think this is probably the most interesting aspect and probably something that most people don't do. I know I don't do this enough uh, using these small pairs as bluffs because it's not it's it's a little bit counterintuitive. And this is where I think using a solver can really enhance your poker game and take it to the next level because realizing, seeing this and then thinking of it from a broader perspective, why are we check racing pocket threes, pocket deuces, pocket fours here? Why are we not check racing a hand like king queen, king queen suited, for example, that are blocking ace king, blocking ace queen and have all these backdoor possibilities? Why are we not check racing a hand like that rather than these shitty small pairs? But the reason for that is because these small pairs don't block any of our opponent's bluffs. And moreover, they're also benefiting a ton from protection because when they check race, they can fold out a hand like King Jack offsuit, King 10 offsuit, hands that are two over cards and has a lot of equity versus our hand if we were to call. So we really want to force folds from those type of holdings. And any over cards that folds, it's just a huge win. But when we have king queen suited ourselves, we don't want to use that as a check race. Yes, we're blocking ace king and blocking king queen and kings and queens, but we want to keep these worse kings in our opponent's range. And we actually have a lot more showdown value and a lot easier to show down king queen and a lot more playability on a lot of turn runouts than we do if we have pocket threes or pocket deuces. So let's look at what happened in game. I see bet for a small size, which we saw was the preferred play. Ole threw in the small 3x check race. And this was my first question. What do I do versus this small C bet on a board where I'm continuation betting my entire range because it's a board that's really favorable for my range and I get check race for a small size. Do I have any three bets in these scenarios? And the answer, as you can see, is Basically, no. There's a small frequency of 3-betting, so 5% of the time, some of these ace-kings and ace-kings wants the 3-bet, clearly because they want to get value from all villains, worse aces, and they want a protection race versus these small pairs that still has two outs to both up. So I went ahead and called, and the turn was the four of hearts. And let's look at Ola's strategy here first. So now we can see he's actually supposed to do a lot of mixing. Mixing meaning that he'll be kind of indifferent or split his range between checking and betting, but quite evenly. So he's not betting a polar polarized range. He's not checking a polarized range. He's betting some the same combination sometimes. So maybe 50% of the time looks like. 
uh, across the board. So very hard to play against this type of strategy because it's very hard to figure out if they have a value hand or a bluff when they're using this sort of mixed strategy where they're betting sometimes and checking sometimes with an even distributions between value and bluffs versus this type of player we really want to proceed with caution and make sure we're not over betting the turn and what i mean by over betting is not that we're using a really big size um, what i mean by that is that we're betting at a too high of a frequency on the turn so we really want to protect our turn betting frequency because otherwise we're gonna leave ourselves exposed and yeah, as you'll see soon a lot of these will go into uh, villains check racing range and even that will be a very even distribution between value and bluffs. And that is why it's so important to be balanced. Because if you're not and you're playing versus someone who picks up on your tendency, it's really easy to get exploited in poker. So anyway, Ola checks. And here's where my second question about the spot occurred. What do I do with my range when I've call the check raise on a really dry board that favors my range and the turn basically doesn't change the board at all and my opponent not checks to me how often am i supposed to bet in this spot and what hands do i bet and what hands do i check back that was my question because i think it answers a lot of questions this is a scenario you're going to find yourself not this particular scenario i'm talking about but if we try to think about it from a broader perspective again a scenario where our opponent's showing aggression we're defending and now our opponent is showing passivity and it's sort of a shift in hand, but it doesn't reflect on the board texture. The board texture hasn't actually changed. What does that actually tell us? Usually you only see this type of shift in aggression when there's a subtle change in the board texture. When the turn or the river is a scare card, you see that the aggressor all of a sudden defers to a passive approach and starts checking. That all makes sense, but what are we supposed to do when the board doesn't change and all of a sudden our opponent checks. What does that tell us about his range and how are we supposed to proceed? So that was my million dollar question that I'm eager to find out here. So let's look at the spot and try to figure it out. So versus the check here, uh, we can see that I'm actually supposed to check almost 80% of the time. And I'm only supposed to bet for the small size around 20% of the time. Four out of five times I'm supposed to check this spot, even though I have all these strong hands in my range which is quite incredible. So the first thing I'll start with is asking myself why. Why is that? And what we can do as well, we can look at the EV here. So here we see the, the EV difference between auto position and us. So the EV of auto position is 34 and we have 54. So there's a huge EV difference for us in our range as opposed to his. So why is it that we're supposed to check 80% of the time here? And this is where you have to use your own creativity in combination with, with some logic and your rational mindset. Because one thing that the computer doesn't do, it doesn't give you an explanation. It only gives you the output in terms of numbers. And then it's up to you to make sense of the numbers and try to find out patterns. I think that's why poker players like Solver so much, because it's very similar to actually playing poker. You're getting all these information, but you're not getting the actual answers. When you see an opponent do something at the poker table, you, it's up to you to make a sense of it, to try to get in that person's head. And solvers actually work the exact same way in the sense that they don't give us any answer, they don't give us any explanations. They just gives us the results, basically. So they're showing us these are the hands, these are the sizes, this is my strategy, this is how you play unexploitable and this is how you exploit or try to exploit this opponent and then if you change that strategy then they're going to give you another output but they're not going to give you an explanation of why that is so that's what's so interesting about studying studying these solvers that we have to sort of make sense of it ourselves and come to our own conclusions and that's i think the most interesting aspect of it all so going back to why I think that we're not supposed to bet here very often, even though we have such a strong range and, and range equity advantage, I think we have to take a step back and look at the big blinds turn strategy. So if we look at the big blinds turn strategy here after he check raised and got called on the flop, and we remember that he's now splitting his range, meaning that he's actually checking a lot of these aces, he's checking a lot of, he's even checking the nuts here sometimes, ace nine, ace four, checking a fair amount. So we have to take that into consideration and we can't just start blind betting here. 
because the big blind is going to get to the tur this turn spot with a much tighter and more nutted range. So he checks to us, and as we can see, ace queen actually prefers to check. It does bet 32% of the time, so it's that was definitely not a mistake to bet. But it goes to show that my assumption that I should be betting my entire range here is is quite quite off. Um, but I will say this, that this is on the assumption that we're playing versus a well-balanced and excellent opponent. I'm not saying Ole wouldn't reach these frequencies and have this balanced turn approach. Uh, I highly doubt it, but I think he, if anyone, would be quite close to this. So I don't think I should be betting my entire range here versus that type of opponent. But in most cases, from my experience, playing with weaker players that has less experience and have definitely haven't studied these type of solvers, those type of players aren't actually very balanced here in their checking range. They're continuing to bet their really strong hands, so their pocket nines, their ace nines, their pocket fours if they got their, their ace kings. So their checking range, I think, is more consists of more hands like the weak aces that are now a little bit concerned that they're actually up against a better ace and now they're trying to pot control all of a sudden even though they went ahead and check raised the flop and uh, now they're trying to keep the pot somewhat manageable and start checking a hand like a6 for example so versus that type of opponent i definitely think i want to go ahead and bet but anyway, let's go with a decision that I actually chose in game. I bet 40% pot on the turn, and Ola's response was to call. As we see, he doesn't actually have any check races versus this small turn bet. But keep in mind that I shouldn't be betting the turn very often at all. So like I'm actually not betting a lot of these floats even. So but if I were to node lock this, meaning that I changed my strategy to betting 100%, then Pio is going to respond with a significant shake racing strategy here. So that's just how it works. So in equilibrium, if you change something, if you change an output, then Pio is going to give you a response to that output. And that's what's so cool about this software. So anyway, in game, I bet 40% and Ole called. And the river was the 10 of spades. And now, yeah, the big blind doesn't have any leads here, which makes sense. It doesn't change the board dynamic all that much. So he checks. And here was my third question about this hand. What do I do on the river? Do I value bet my combination the way I played it? Do I check back? And if I do value bet, what size do I pick? So in the inputs here, I picked... 50% and 100% in game I used the pot size bet meaning 100% of the pot but because Ole only had 250 behind and the pot is now 160 Pio so what Pio does here is that it automatically converts the pot size bet to an all in size because it doesn't think it makes sense to bet pot here when we have less than 2x pot left to play Pio thinks that we might as well go all in so that's why we only have these two options, half pot and 1.5x pot. Those are the options. And here my assumption was quite right that I don't think we want to use the smaller bet size very often. I don't think that makes much sense since we're quite polarized in our strategy here. So when we are value betting, we don't want to use a really big size or check back basically. And the reason for this is that when we have a polarized betting strategy, we have our really strong hands and we have our really weak hands. With our really strong hands, we want to extract max value. And with our really weak hands, i.e. our bluffs, we want to maximize our fall liquidity, max pressure on our opponent's range. And then we want to sort of create this balance where we're making our opponents indifferent to calling or folding. And that is why we're using this big size. Ironically, though, we can see that the, the only real combination or the favorite combination for using the half pot bet size is actually ace queen, which is the hand I had in game. So ace queen prefers to check back, uh, but when it does bet, it prefers the half pot size bet. So I went all in, um, but for sake of matter, let's look at the 1.5x pot size. And lastly, let's just look at the big blind's response to this over bet on the river. And this is quite interesting. So he's actually folding ace five, ace six, ace seven to ace eight, 
but he's calling ace four, ace three, and ace deuce. And this might be a little bit tricky to wrap your head around, um, but this is another cool thing that you'll realize when you start working with solvers. So here again, we don't have an answer for why this is. We need to make our own conclusion of why they're calling the weaker aces and folding these better aces when these are ranked higher than these. So the reason for this is 100% the blocker effect. If we go back to my betting strategy here on the river, we can see that I'm using uh, five, sixes, sevens through eights uh, in my bluffs. So when I'm using those in my bluffs and my opponent is aware of this, he doesn't want to call ace eight through ace five because then he's blocking a big portion of my bluffs. But when he has one of these low cards, we can see I don't have any low cards in my bluffing range. I don't have pocket threes or deuces and I'm not shoving ace three or ace deuce. And then he also has the reverse blocker effect. So the probability of me having one of these smaller mid pairs actually goes up when he has one of these other ace x combinations so that's why these are great calls these are bad calls uh, but then we move on and then we look at what else he's calling and folding even a hand like ace queen is indifferent to folding or calling all right so that will wrap up this hand breakdown if you enjoyed this format please show support by smashing the like button Comment below if you have any other hands that you would like to see me break down this way. But for now, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.